<laughs> All right, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Redefining Society podcast, where we talk about society and technology and technology and society, which is, goes in a circle and then goes the other way around. And lately, more and more, uh, I, I, I make this joke that if I don't have at least an episode about generative AI every two, I get in trouble with the law because <laughs> <laughs> the law is now to talk about that. <laughs> and I truly enjoy it. Um, I'm not the tech kind of guy, but, you know, I like to look at how it's affecting society, creativity, the way we live and the way we produce content, which I'm kind of going that direction because today we're going to talk about that. I am super excited about having James uh, Maynard here on the show with me. Um, he is a creator himself. He's a, a science communicator. We're going to talk probably touch on science and uh, and the cosmos and all the things that he does. And uh, I'm, I have high expectations, so no pressure. <laughs> 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 no, seriously, uh, this is video and audio. So the person you list, you heard uh, laughing is James. How about uh, you do a quick That's introduction me. about yourself so people are sure that I'm not making it up. You're really here. Sure. My name is Charlie Periwinkle and I'm from... <laughs> <laughs> I got the guess <laughs> wrong again. <laughs> That's what I did. Damn it. Uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. My name is James Maynard, and I um, I grew up around around the space program. My dad uh, designed electronics for first the Apollo and then the space shuttle programs, and um, but I also I've always had a passion for art and uh, film and music and. Um, other forms of creativity. And um, so, you know, when I was a kid, I put out a, um, a homemade magazine that my mother would, you know, I'd write up a paragraph about the or two about the latest science stories I heard, and I'd draw up a cover for it and hand it to my mother who'd go and Xerox it off for me, I'd go peddling it around the neighborhood, you know, Probably made about two dollars and fifty cents a week, you know. <laughs> As a kid, it's not but, too bad. <laughs> so, so it's not too bad, right? Right. And uh, and so now I'm pretty much. Uh, so I've done all sorts of things, got a degree in physics and chemistry, and run hundreds of star parties, and written several books, and yada yada yada. Um, but now, I, I, but what my goal is still to. Um, blend together science, really great science with, with art, with film, with literature, um, and with the amazing, incredible power of storytelling. It's, um, I think that um, the best way to bring more science education into the world is to make people fall in love with science again. And the best way to do that is through the power of storytelling and art. Absolutely. I agree. And that's why we, we, I was in between going on Audio Signals, which is one of the podcasts that talk about stories and storytelling Great and sense. redefining society. But because we, we had this plan, maybe we'll do another episode to talk about that. But Love I think the point is what you just said. It, it's, you can't detach one from the other. You, you can't right. teach unless you have stories. And, you know, as some writers say, if you have a good story to tell, you know, you're, you're pretty good. But you also need to know how to tell it and have maybe the tools. Mm -hmm. So today we, we, we said we were going to focus not much on the Xerox process of <laughs> back in the days, but the, the incredible power that come with the generative AI. So I know you've been experimenting quite a bit with that for your show. So um, are you one of those that, and I, I mean, I'm sure you're embracing it because you're using it. You're not just say, yep, forget about this. But how do you feel is affecting the creators in, in general? Uh, it's a... uh, you know, I think the best way to think of it is that uh, generative AI is the greatest tool for the democratization of filmmaking 
since the invention of the movie camera. Hmm. All right. The, you know, when you look at these films, and I'm not going to pick on one particular film here, but I can name the title. I don't want to hear from their lawyers. But they went in. <laughs> All right. But they went to film at an airport. And the director said, oh, no, no, no. You know, I, I, don't, I don't want this airport tower to be this color. I want it to be a different color. So they built an entirely new fake tower just so this thing could look slightly differently than the one that was already there. And it was hundreds of thousands of dollars in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. All right. And, uh, and so these humongous budgets have, have had a couple of problems. And one of them is that too many movies now are being made. Uh, for this, really, for the sole purpose of of making money for the investors, and when that happens, I feel like we lose a lot of the art and the storytelling and the magic that is great filmmaking. And nowadays, you know, I'm spending a lot of time on the film circuits with a lot of you know independent filmmakers. And the energy and the artistry that's coming out from people around the world is just truly revolutionary. It's, it's, it's astounding. And it's, it's allowing people who could never before make uh, more than the most basic movie and giving them the power and the resources of major movie studios. Yep. It's, it's reduced the cost of uh, filmmaking by probably two magnitudes, by 99%. Yeah. So I like the democratization, the democratization. Um, big fan of that. I mean, mm -hmm. we've seen it in social media, we've seen it with you know, the influencers, we've seen it with people who are able to create content, able to write. Uh, you know, the blog and don't, don't have to go through somebody that is your agent and an editor. And I mean, you, you can put content out there. Now, somebody like me coming from before internet, <laughs> which has become like, you know, a time in, um, in our era and studying mass media, you know, one of the things that, that you can make a point is, okay, democratization is great, but do you lose quality? like that filter, I mean, that barrier, is it, is it a good thing or a bad thing in the long run? Like everybody can make movies, everybody can write, mm -hmm. but is that all good or verified in terms of like, I don't know, information uh, and, and so on. So, yeah, I think if you're, I think there's probably a couple different ways to take that question. And one is, um, is the quality as good as, you know, if I want to shoot a scene, you know, and use AI for backgrounds and what have you, is that as good as flying a whole film crew out to, you know, Montreal and I'm in Arizona, um, you know, and paying all sorts of people and running up hotel bills and, you know, can you do things better the old fashioned way? Right now, yes, if you're looking to get something highly realistic. Mm. But, <laughs> but the, um, but I think, first of all, um, the technology of AI is, of course, growing by leaps and bounds. I mean, yeah. 15, 18 months ago, when we were all first playing with, Dolly, and the first you know variation of uh, first public variation of, of ChatGPT, you know we thought that was really cool then, and it was, but that is primitive compared to Absolutely. you know what we're yeah. seeing and able to do today. And five years down the line, it may be on par with doing a multi-million dollar shot, but. What's really, 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 really cool to me is that there are um, 
that the limitations imposed on filmmakers and creators by where AI is now is helping people, and especially to create new styles, mm. to create new ways of doing things, new ways of shooting. Um, you know, and you know, we're able to take advantage of old ways of doing things as well. Oh, I can't get this, you know person's face to look quite right while they're talking. Okay, great. I'll spin the whole thing around and do a, you know, do an over the shoulder shot. So you're only seeing the back of the person's head problem solved. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and I just love the new styles that people are coming up with now. Yeah. And the way this technology allows people to form new new ways of doing things and new yeah. new new styles i just I, I just adore it yeah no I, i'm with you and i i actually I, I get what you said like there's two ways to respond because quality may be the quality of you know as you, as you outline the quality of the product or mm -hmm. the quality of the creative input and you know not just the output but the story itself i mean you still mm -hmm. need that creativity Oh, absolutely. That, right? So um, tell me the way that you you use it, right? So mm -hmm. you talk about the first version of Dali, and I agree. I'm like, ah, can I actually use this even to make a cover <laughs> for, you know? But, but it was fascinating. It still right. created something from my input, my prompt. So, you know, it was already cool, but yeah, this is 18 years ago and now we are a completely different level. So how did you grow in, in the way that you were using that and applying to your content that you do for your job? Mm. Yeah, um, I mean, that's a great question. And I am what is called an app smasher. <laughs> I don't use just one app for anything. I will create, you know, use, you know, this to set up the basic scene, use that other completely different system to do the sound, put music on with a third, you know, move this all around, pan and zoom with another app, you know. And so, um, but generally speaking, I find there are four and um, four systems that are really, really incredible right now um, to me, which are Mid Journey which excels at creating really good still images. Um, and then there's Runway, which does a similar thing with videos, uh, except to me, I think Midjourney does better to start with, uh, and then Runway is able to take over the video from there. Um, there's Suno, which has just made the last version of it, I think it's version three, it's just made leaps and bounds in its creation, its ability to create music. Um, and uh, then there's Eleven Labs, which creates um, voices, you know, allows you to do dialogue. So a typical thing for me might be, you know, say create a character um, in, in Big Journey and create a background for them separately. Um, bring the character into runway and make it move a little bit naturally and then add a voice using Suno, but that has to be put in through runway so you can make the lip sync and that comes uh, over to um, uh, Suno, excuse me, from the music, 11 Labs is the voice and um, and then that all gets mixed in a typical digital audio workstation type thing where you see, you know, this video clip, that video clip, and this audio clip and that move them all mm -hmm. any which way you want. So that's, and so I've talked with several um, filmmakers around the world who have, who are doing uh, AI powered films and educational materials and it's that's a pretty it's getting to be a pretty standard combination for mm. people those four are pretty powerful together so he, here's the vision that i had in my mind when you're showing me this this visual of a storyboard 
where you use yeah. four different or more probably apps and yeah. and then you have one process one process i just recently read a biography of walt disney and it mm. made me think about you know the power of animation in creating you know the impossible the the thing that you couldn't create in in real life you go into animation and you can actually create kind of what you want so it it make the vision so less uh constrict in a way i, I don't know right. i mean th 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 do you see that it's, it's kind of like that sci-fi is becoming reality and then what is sci-fi any any longer right and speaking of sci-fi um perfect example of this is star trek you know long before the days of ai or even anything we would call cgi or <laughs> pretty much anything we call special effects. Um, these people, you know, Gene Roddenberry and, um, and the crew were trying to put on a really, really cool sci-fi show, which had never really been done before, um, on building, building models. Every time you want to show a spaceship, you had to build a model of it and, you know, fly it along a string in front of a Mm -hmm. in front of a uh, you know star a, you know piece of star chart and um, but and so the um, studio as I say the network deciding that you know this was far too expensive to pay people to you know make all these models and dress people up up in you know silly silly costumes and paint them green uh, you know just started cutting their budget over and over again so then we you know we get to the third season of the original star trek and you know we're having you know basically one shot shows of you know, episodes of you know space hippies <laughs> and um so um so those herberts really took down, <laughs> took down star trek by starving it of funds mm. all right and now we no longer need to build these build these sets. We no longer need to dye people green. All right. We could do that all in front of a green screen, like the one behind me, and uh and post-production. And using AI, the, the you can get a really a really powerful suite, you know, suite of things for, you know, let's say a few hundred bucks a month. <laughs> The people, filmmakers are no longer held hostage mm. to the to the financiers, and I think that's going to be pretty pretty amazing for for bringing science back mm. for educational materials and and entertainment. Now, when you talk about these things, I mean you're mixing <clears throat> kind of the the big budget that then eventually become less budget. As you mm -hmm. said about Star Trek, as you're describing that, I'm thinking like the lighting and magic from George Lucas and how that entire system was also about inventing, you know, mm -hmm. in, in the lab, the physical aspect of yeah. the filming. And then yeah. computer came in, CGI came in, they all, they got smaller and smaller, the people hammering on stuff and, and bigger and bigger, the people typing on stuff. Little tiny hammers. <laughs> A little tiny camera that goes through the canyon and, and all of that. And and so many people now are like, well, they're taking jobs away. Yeah, well, it's taking jobs away, but it's kind of redistributing the jobs. So to the people that are against generative AI, because it allows to do things with smaller budget without involving certain kind of knowledge, I mean, what what is your reaction to that? Because they're definitely on the side of welcoming this. Clearly, <laughs> I don't mm -hmm. think I misread you. Um, so to the people that are a little bit more on the conservative side, uh, what's your answer to that? Yeah, um, you know, things, you know, uh, industries and technologies change over time. And, you know, that's a great thing. You know, the first, the first computers um, you know, with like ENIAC, were built with these vacuum tubes, and there were just tens of thousands of vacuum tubes in each box, and you know, boxes filling up warehouses, 
And you know, I'm willing to bet that the vacuum tube industry was mm. was quite the thing back in the 40s, 50s. But then you get the invention of the transistor. Yep. That put the the uh, you know vacuum tube people out of business pretty quickly. But the amount of jobs created in electronics and computer engineering and computer science skyrocketed. And um, and so I think that, you know, nobody is a monoculture, you know, people who are working at these huge industries can actually probably um, reposition skills in other ways, either filling their, you know, creating their own film houses um, or creating their own new ways of doing things. 3D films, there's so much technology and so, so much space to open up new ways of doing things. I think that, um, that this really is gonna change things. And, but I think all in all, when you look at it for the, over the big picture, there's, there's some amazing opportunities out there. And, and I just want to see these tens of millions of other people who no longer can do, who currently cannot do anything being, being given this huge amount of access. And I think it's a good thing. Mm. No, that definitely for the creators. I, yeah, I agree with you. And and you know, let, let's talk about this. I mean, you, you look back. You told me at the beginning one of your at the beginning before we start recording. One of your first book was actually <clears throat> looking at the Roman Empire, and your background right. is chemistry and, and physics. And so now you now we're talking about movie making and entertainment. <laughs> so in a way, you know, we we like to wear different hats. I think when you when, when you find passion in something, you you just go and learn it. So uh, I'm not saying go, everybody go and learn something new, but don't sit on a knowledge that nowadays is going to change. Um, industry like cybersecurity, you've never finished learning. Industry like computer science. Right. And now, obviously, we're not using the same camera we did the Wizard of Oz. Right. 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 <laughs> That's exactly. Big. I've seen it. Exactly. It's really big. And that was anyway the first color movie. And probably people were like, what the hell? Color? Who needs color? But my point is change. If we didn't change, we will be still, I don't know, in, in caves. Somebody right. has to right. disrupt something. Right. Yeah, I, there was a time not long ago, 50, 75 years ago, when Many people were still arguing about whether or not photography should be considered art. Mm. You know, and now through all the amazing, you know, photographers and Ansel Adams and Annie Leibovitz and, you know, we see there's no way of denying that that is art. And, um, but, you know, I but there was a time when people were saying, oh, all you do is just point the camera and snap, you know, and it's a, it's a and it's just so much more to that. I mean, I've taken an online video course with Annie and she's just the depth of what is possible with photography is just astonishing. It really is. Mm. And, you know, and there are a lot of people now who say, oh, well, all you do with AI is just tell it to give you a picture of a pumpkin in space wearing a top hat. And Which that's pretty cool. Well, that's kind of where you start <laughs> and, you know, and then you run it through iterations and go through different versions and yada, 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 yada. Oh. Um, but I think, I think this type of thing that we're seeing, this backlash that's coming from about AI now is just another form of what we've seen many, many, many times before. There was outrage about the invention of the bicycle. 
<laughs> and now yeah, they just and seem the so. I yeah. Mean, people losing job because they were using the horses. Well, right. Another perfect example. Yeah, but yeah. I, I love the photo one because uh, the, the, the photographer one. My, my uncle was a photographer. I remember he, he was teaching in school. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, and I had fun as a kid going his, in, his, uh, in his lab and developing mm, the film. Right. And oh, the, I love that. The smell love of that. Yeah. the acid yeah. and hanging it and, and the magic of seeing the, you know, on white paper, the image materialize. Right. I mean, I, so I, I love the smell of fixer in the morning. I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how good it was for our health, but anyway, that that was kind of fun. And and then you were shooting, uh, like I don't know, in fashion, and and you had a finite number of shot in the in the film. And sure, you had to be good because you weren't just shooting six hundred thousand shot on a digital camera. Right. But right. Again, right that progression has always been there. So the people that were against photography at the beginning, that was at art. Then when it, the digital camera came out, I was like, oh my God, now that it was art until digital, now it's not. Now it's in your phone. Right. But still, I can see if, if something is a good picture or not. I don't, it's not the tool, it's the people that use that tool, the vision Absolutely. that they have. Right, right, right. right. And people need and... to understand that with AI. Yes, yes, absolutely. Um, and, you know, and like I said, you know, I mean, there are, I, I just, I don't know, how, I know I've said this before, but it's just the new styles of filmmaking that are coming about now, partly because of the limitations of what we're currently able to do with AI, are just, another are another um could be another new age mm. of of filmmaking you know painting went through all sorts of different ages positivism impressionism um post-realism whatever and film is much much younger but we still have you know the early age of, you know, uh, Edison's films and, you know, the great uh, golden age in the 30s and 40s, Wizard of Oz, the film noir mm. um, era uh, through all sorts of psychedelic era of the late 60s. Do I really need to watch a monkey's in head again? <laughs> mm, maybe <laughs> the you know, ultra realism of the '70s, sci-fi, Star Wars, you know, and and so just like you know, painting went through all these ages. So so does filmmaking and the tech, and that is driven partly by technology, black and white cameras, color cameras, you know, really good microphones, um, and everything interacts with one another mm. and the way that generative ai is affecting um film and education now i think has is huge huge potential yeah i love that you know another thing that people you're kind of going there too it's like contextualizing what what you see right if i watch casablanca Mm -hmm. And I look at the way they use the lighting, the shadow on the on the wall and, and mm. what they do, right? I can't say that's better than or worse than a Marvel movie now. It's just different. Mm -hmm. right? Is there quality? There is something I like. I need to contextualize in what they had at the time. If I look at Ansel Adams' photo, it may not be as well defined as a 4K. <laughs> you know, image right now, but that's right. not the point. The point is, right. exactly. what were these people, what were these people doing with the tech given to them at that time? And, and exactly and, right. And now it's what you're saying is like the things that we can do now, we couldn't even think about it before. But the thing we can't think about CGI, this two years ago. Can, yeah. So it's actually a, an exciting moment, I think, to to be alive. I, I would like to know what uh, E.T. the extraterrestrial would have been with AI. <laughs> mm. <laughs> right? Mm. I mean, 
Am I gonna make it or, go or the, the original with the bike? <laughs> right, right. There you go. Or go back further. The original Wizard of Oz. Imagine mm. that no. all being done with. AI. I mean, actually, you know, speaking of which, in another classic that would come to mind um, would have been Willy Wonka. But the newest version of Willy Wonka is actually pretty good. <laughs> I don't know if you've seen it, but um, um, and um, so I think, you know, that as we go on, you know, this technology is going to drive art and education and storytelling in ways that we we can't imagine now. No. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a new new version of something. Uh, you just not a good example you just made. It's how many Willy Wonka have been remade? How many other movies have been remade just because now you can do something different? It's not again, not better than the first one. But Man. different. It's a different vision given by the new technology that you have. And maybe you come up with something completely unpredictable. And that's that's art, right? That's that's mm. cool. So right. talking about unpredictability, what what do you have in your uh in your near future in terms of creation? You know, the, this last five minutes, you know, what uh What's up in James uh, <laughs> to do this? <Sure. laughs> Excuse me. Um, well, first, I have a weekly science comedy interview show, uh, The Cosmic Companion. And uh, just search for The Cosmic Companion. You'll find me on whatever, whatever outlet you're on. Um, and I also create a little short films uh, every now and again, uh, one one most recent one was uh, is called Moon Beans, about uh, two women living on the moon who decide to build the the moon's first uh, coffee shop <laughs> nice, <laughs> called <I> Moon like Beans, <laughs> um, and uh, so and now I'm actually working on two uh, feature length films powered by AI. <clears throat> the first of them is called um, Gaia Rising, and it's a future history of climate change. It's a Clive Fi story about three very different people from around the world who need to come together to um, offset uh, some, some of the worst climatic changes happening in the world at their time. And the second uh, is called um, The Wizard and the Scholar, or A Rapscallion Runs a Muck and Rye. And uh, this film, which I'm wearing the, t the first T-shirt, thank you cool. very much, uh, <laughs> um, is actually set in the year 1156 in Rye, England, um, when two women, both of whom are on their own search for home and truth need to come together with the most famous thief in history, Robin Hood, uh, to solve a, a, a tragic murder and save the town of Rye from uh, even darker threats. And so, and so in, I'm hoping to have um, the Wizard and the Scholar out at the uh, Halloween weekend. I have mm -hmm. penciled in Halloween weekend this year and sometime probably spring for Gaia Rising. Um, and so in each of those films, I try my best to spread knowledge using entertainment. Uh, Gaia Rising, of course, talks a lot about these climatic changes that could happen, how people might react to them, uh, how government might react to them. Uh, you'll notice I separated government from people. That, that, that was not a <laughs> <Yeah>. mistake. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, of course, uh, the wizard and the scholar takes, even though the the main characters are fictional and Robin Hood was legendary based on a few different people, uh, all the events happening around them 
our actual history that was going on mm. around that era. So I hope to teach a little bit about history, science, and um, uh, and what it was like to what it was like to live in the middle of the twelfth century. I like it. Two two very different topics. So you can experiment with different things, and uh, mm -hmm. at the same time, it's uh, it's kind of like what you. I mean, it, 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 can you confirm that everything you do has always some kind of educational, scientific, or historical? I try like, driven yeah. vision, right? You do, yeah, you don't yeah, that's my goal. Something call. completely off the hook. It's you want to have a a goal, an educational goal with it. Yes, but I don't want to be obvious about it. I don't think you are. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's what makes you special. And and I think that also the reason why people like you are really welcoming this new technology and, and, and feel that need of experimenting with, uh, with things. Um, so I, I think it's important. And I think that I hope that people that listen to this, now they go out there, they take one of the app that you just mentioned and they start playing with it and maybe even people that didn't yeah. want to touch it with a fishing pole before you critic just give it a go it's you're gonna right. be amazed for sure yeah, yeah yeah i was gonna say actually the wizard and the scholar i co-wrote with pi which is another language model Mm -hmm. And it was like working with an, with a right human writing partner. You know, Pi produced about literally about 200 pages of notes and script ideas and story ideas and dialogue. And mm -hmm. it, was, it was it was amazing. It was like having a writing partner that I could talk to at one in the morning. When I'm like, wait a minute, I figured out the ship has to go this way in order to. You know, <laughs> oh, you're right. We should do this. And, you know, and it, yeah. it's, it's, so it's amazing. Yeah, I had uh, I had a few conversations driving with uh, um, Chad GPT and say, what if we do this? And, you know, on the app, on the phone and, and having a conversation until it says, you exhausted all your credit for this. <laughs> <laughs> you're like, oh, get shit. those messages daily. <laughs> <laughs> Buy another four bucks. Click. Yeah. <laughs> 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 it's like playing video games. I almost broke the record. Let me put another coin in there and see what I can do. <laughs> well, James, a uh, lot of fun. I think a was, lot of interesting great. conversation and point. And uh, I hope people will enjoy you. I will have all the links to your to your uh, LinkedIn social media website and the Cosmic Companion and all of that in the notes. And I hope that they will stay tuned. Hopefully, you'll come back and we talk about uh, other you. things Thank about you. the storytelling. This was the Defining Society podcast. Uh, James, thank you again for being with thank us. You. And thank you to all yeah. the listeners. I hope they thank you, Marco. Will enjoy. And they also check your show because uh, um, this is about helping each other as well when you, when you do the Absolutely. podcast. It's, uh, it's a good thing. Thank you again. Absolutely. Stay All right, tuned, thank everybody. you, Marco. All right, thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. All right, yeah, bye-bye.